We're sitting here March 3rd, 2023 in Berlin, the day after Dan played at the Refocus Night, and I want to ask him a few questions about his career as a musician, his part in the sound system, and as a filmmaker, as well as all the other things in between. Tell us first, how did you get into electronic music originally? What attracted you to it? How did you get involved and what was the main inspiration? I was very lucky in that uh, I've got an older brother who's five years older, uh, Luke, who uh, was listening and going to raves at Labyrinth and big uh, acid uh, warehouse raves. And so he was already passing tapes to me when I was 12, 13 of old school hardcore and such. Coupled with that, I was I was really into sort of indie music, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Smashing Pumpkins, all of that sort of stuff. And so that was all sort of bubbling away in the background. And when I started to be old enough to want to go out 15, 16, there was a load of things going on, protests and squat parties. I just loved the environment. It was such an amazing contrast to the sobriety and the the boring mundaneness of of London life. It was a combination of those two, sort of getting pulled in by the the lifestyle and this new and exciting music that seemed so much fresher than anything else that was out there. So you started first just going to raves. What caused you to become more actively involved? You know, I'd go to different sort of raves, stuff that was happening in Claremont Road in Leighton that was more sort of protest based where they'd have tiny squat raves in little little houses to sort of bigger <clears throat> warehouse raves happening in in Hoxton and and all around London and, and I was always attracted to the harder and faster and and darker music which was mainly Gabba at the time. And it was also from going to uh, a technival in the south of France and other sort of bigger festivals and always sort of drawn towards that sort of, that darker music and not really finding much of it out there. There'd be an hour or two at the end of the night or there, there would be these small events that would occasionally take place that I'd go down to Hellraiser, dead by dawn and for me and my small group of friends they were they were the most exciting things going on musically and um but they were removed these sort of events where there would be this really hard music from the environments that we really enjoyed the the underground uh, raves where it would happen in these huge abandoned buildings where there wouldn't be a cut off time and me and my friends, we just wanted as much as possible to bring that sort of stuff that we liked and put it in the environment of uh, free party and technical. And so that basically inspired us, uh, me, Francis, Ben and Davey, um, to get together and, and form our own sound system. We managed to get a connection to buy a uh, two double scoops and two mid cabinets with, with tops set in them um, from a, a mate of a mate, basically. We managed to blow the sound system the first event that we did, uh, and quite a few events after that, actually. It took us a long while to get our heads around how you sound engineer things, and the first few years were, were confusion and mess. We, we managed to make it out to um, Czech Tech, in 96 by basically putting different speakers in different vans and then getting all the stuff together when we were on site. I think we only managed to have our rig playing for like a total of eight hours over a three day period. And we had all sorts of brilliant sound engineers come over and look at our rig and scratch their heads and it would work for a bit and then it, then it would go off. But we thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and and then to get to the next event, we had to send one of our crew, Francis, off by himself. He, he had to go and find a lift in the in the technival, going asking people truck to truck, have you got space for me and some speakers? And so he had to basically hitchhike with these double bass bins to Rotterdam, where where we did a technival on a beach. Um, 
But that was great. We had loads of cool people come and play on our tiny sound system. It went on for a long time, the, the, the technical. I can't remember how, how long. At one point, I believe one of our crew played two records for like four hours on in the middle of the night sometime to to like a couple of ravers so it was very small beginnings aside from the sort of competitive nature of the london free party system at the time we found a, a ton of cohorts who were more than happy to to find these these teenagers who had this sort of real energy and verve to to get out there and and put on events and so we got we got a lot of help and eventually found our way. You mentioned the check deck. Was that when it started? The first party happened as an, I think it was an after party to reclaim the streets with Jibba sound system and Chiba sound system in a, in a party in London Fields, um, a a building that was squatted just for, just for the night. We had very few of our own DJs, so our sound wasn't properly fully formed. Ben was our main DJ. He was he was one of the crew, uh, and uh, but he'd only been mixing for like half a year or so. We weren't old heads at all. We just had this real taste for hard music and 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 a desire to to get it out there. And then you started doing quite a lot of parties in London as well. Yeah, after that, in the following years, me and 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 the other core members were still at uh, at uni. Uh, we didn't yet have trucks and stuff, but we we our actual posse grew quite quickly. Uh, my brother Luke joined and started doing artwork. Ashley joined and started doing some backdrops. We met up with Mark and Claire and Zane, who had and Ian who had this great squat in, in Stockwell uh, where we used to go back to and plot after these Gabba parties or after we'd done an event and they had a lot of connections and from them we brought in other DJs, people like Will the Reverend came and started spinning for us and, and then as soon as we started doing things people realised that we were providing this sort of different new sound and so anyone who was who was keen on that sound would come and play christoph would come and play had dj scud come and play and and a big big inspiration for us was a plasmodio sound system an italian sound system that we met when we were traveling in the summer of 96. they uh, and especially sasha hated the idea of this sort of boring um, formulated techno that uh, was what most people were playing at the time and was uh, came with all these fresh records from Italy, Sounds Never Seen by Laurie D, stuff by Leo Annabaldi um, and we joined up with Sasha and Leo and did events in London sometimes with this great sound system Vox Populi and sometimes they'd be very successful and our room would be full, everyone would be completely into it. And sometimes they'd be a complete failure. We'd have three people who weren't even listening to the music. We'd all get too fucked up and the sound system wouldn't work. So it was a very mixed bag. I moved in with a lot of the posse and we, we, we had a squat in Broccoli in, in this road, Foxbury Road. and. And, and the next summer after 96, we got our shit together and we, um, we bought a truck and we put all the sound system and that. And by that point, we had a lot of artwork. And that was always, as we moved forward, a big draw for people because we had so many great artists um, doing these brilliant backdrops that were basically paintings that you could hang in a gallery they were so good they weren't by my hand i can't paint for shit but th these these great artists would would put up stuff and i think it just snowballed because when you have a lot of diverse and eclectic art that you're producing you act as a homing beacon for other artists and musicians who haven't had a chance to play their stuff because they were stopped because they were female DJs or because they were playing jungle at a time when people only wanted techno or they were playing stuff that was too experimental or too hard or they wanted to do paintings and backdrops or sculptures but none of the other sound systems cared about that so they were drawn towards us. 
we were never though a rarely and when we were it didn't work for us to be the main sound system we worked so much better when we were linked up with other people when we could do our thing and we didn't have to pander and cater for a dance floor that hungered to have a driving techno beat all the way through the night we we were able much more as a, a second room or or a sound system that you'd find at the back of a technoval to really experiment and give an opportunity to uh, a sound that you wouldn't hear anywhere else and you expanded your activities into europe we, what we would do is we'd do occasional forays into europe in the summer when there'd be a lot of technicals happening in eastern europe and more and more we were drawn to that and the life on the road and we all tried to get our driving license and buy trucks and by uh the end of the 90s we were living in europe and what we would do mainly is uh travel around in the summer and then plot in what it's generally Italy or Spain for the winter months where we we do a series of parties in Rome with fire at work in Spain where there'd be big social centers uh, where we could where we could uh, work on our music and our sound and and do little events and then go off traveling in, in the summer um and This built more and more until we were a properly fully fledged part of the whole technical circuit into the mid noughties. Uh, then it started to die off. A lot of people uh, don't like to talk about the end of stuff, but it, there was very much an end to what we were doing. Not as a sound system, because we still do uh, the odd event and we're still connected. Uh, it's, it's, it's nothing like it was. Uh, and it happened because people get lives. They, uh, they have kids, they find jobs, they, they didn't want this constant lifestyle. So we went, we shrunk from a crew that was 15, 20 strong and, and was very multinational. We'd have Italians, French, Germans, Swiss, whoever would be part of our sound system. But uh, everyone sort of broke off. And even though we had all the equipment and loads of art, I found myself with two people with all this equipment, all these, all these trucks, but unable to put on events because we didn't have the crew to put up all this great art that we had. We didn't have the crew to run the sounds. And so we'd all have to play for hours on an end. And it just became a bit sad, you know, because the whole power of our sound system came from the team, from the ability to uh, to move from ska music into jungle, into breakcore, into experimental, into gabba, and uh, range across all these musical genres and create a night that surprised and, and engaged you to something that was, that was smaller because it, it, it Without that crew, it, it, it lacked that power. And so uh, it got to a point where where we had to scale back and um, I moved back to England. And that's not to say we haven't kept those connections. There's still, we did uh, an event in Lyon last year. This year we're, we're plotting a, a three-day event in Forte Brennestino in Rome. But life moves on and... And new crews come and 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 things evolve. Uh, so, you know, we had our heyday and and those memories will live forever and that and we will create new ones, but it won't be ever at that power and volume that, that it was. I guess that's the sound system history. Yeah, in a very condensed environment. Lots of people I haven't mentioned. Uh, but yeah. But spinning off from the sound system, you also started making live music and later records. And you slash the sound system ran several labels. Yes, yes. Shall we talk about the uh, music first or the labels? Yeah, I guess the music and then from there into the labels. Because the music yeah. came first. Yeah. I've always been into creating stuff i'm i'm now a filmmaker and and still a musician uh the time i was hugely interested in in music and excited very much by live sets and 
what you could do in with a live set, uh, particularly what Sasha was doing, what uh, Simon Crystal Distortion was doing. Um, and those, uh, particularly those two were very um, inspiring to me. I was just wander traveling around Europe and I was um, in the back of a truck, Simon was playing a live set and I was like, can I have a go? And he was like, yeah, have a go. And I played to an audience with his beats and loops, but for half an hour before anyone noticed that this uh, spotty 16 year old was, was doing a live set and they were like, what, what are you doing here? And, um, and uh, Sasha sold me his sampler for, for next to nothing, showed me how to use it. And I was never classically trained as a musician. So when I went in, I was just experimenting and throwing stuff together and seeing what worked without the, um, the, string, the pressure that's put on you as a composer when you've got all that weight of knowledge of what music should be. So it was very easy for me to go in with this fresh approach to music. And uh, I found that people will really connected very well with, with what I was doing uh, when we were in the right environments. I also had people uh, th uh, threaten to beat me up with hammers and, and physically me abuse me for my music, cut off generators while I was playing to stop me. So there was a lot of stuff to contend to, but that sort of thing just made me more insistent to continue what I was doing and the road that I was on. And it wasn't long before um, Kevin from New Skin proposed that I do a split with, with Crystal from Praxis on New Skin One. Uh, and people, people seemed to like that, that first record. And at the time it was very easy to make and sell records. And so, so soon enough I started um, Hex with Andy Redmax, uh, Davey started Coven H and, and then eventually I took on New Skin from Kevin and uh, at first it was, it was an avenue to get my music out but soon enough we, we started releasing and producing stuff from uh, other artists that we were connected to that was uh, exciting to us and we felt needed to get out there and it was just such a lovely playground because it coupled so well with what we were doing in terms of traveling around so I would produce a record make 500 to a thousand I'd then swap my record with people like uh, Christoph Praxis, Christoph Toolbox and others as well as people I'd meet on the way so I'd have a huge selection of different records that I'd paid very little for because I'd only paid for my records to be produced and then I'd go to these different cities where we were traveling around as a sound system set up my stall or just have people come to my truck and I'd be able to sell them vinyl and live off that because the markup was great uh, if only such a thing existed for musicians now it's it's very sad that you can make so little money from making your own music now. Uh, and those bastards at Spotify and all the other channels that, that basically rape and pillage music for their own ends is, uh, we can't forget how much those people destroyed the livelihood of independent musicians. At some point, you already hinted at it, the labels became defunct in the early 2000s, I think. Was that in the context of the whole music industry changing or was it more personal motivation? I mean, that was a period where I was trying to pursue film stuff and coming back to England from living in Europe. So I guess there was less the chance to, to sell vinyl and when you're not selling vinyl then it becomes less interesting to make it you're not having all those exciting conversations where people are coming and discovering stuff but it was also the massive drop off we'd make stuff and uh the birth of youtube and the proliferation of uh of the internet just sort of destroyed people's desire to buy vinyl so we would 
we made, um, I think Coven H7 was a massive failure for us. It was uh, an album that I made with this amazing artwork uh, that, that, that my brother Luke did. Um, and, you know, uh, we put a lot of time and energy and no, no one bought it. We ended up having to throw boxes and boxes of that vinyl away. And I think after that, we tried other records and things just weren't working. They weren't selling. And uh, part of that maybe was a turn I took with my music. The uh, change from, in my own sort of production, from hardware into into these softwares that weren't yet at the point where you could create stuff that was really strong using stuff like the first versions of Reason and Fruity Loops, which uh, might have been good enough to do interesting live sets with, but weren't. I wasn't producing music that was at a level. So I think everything coupled together just sort of brought all of it to a close, uh, which is sad, but you know, there's, it, it lives on in other forms. And so, it, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess a combo of things as, as most things tend to be, you know. But I mean, you've continued to make music yourself and still release music such as the Wirebug album on Praxis. And I assume you intend to continue. Yes. I, I do, uh, but I'm less and less drawn to sequence stuff out uh, as as tracks. I spend a lot of time making music for my live sets because it's a bit sad for me to just release a track that sits on Bandcamp and gets a couple of plays or you put it up on YouTube uh, and no one really checks it out. I mean, I'd much rather uh spend my time creating live sets and then releasing them into the wild and and people can enjoy them like that um and maybe that's because i'm going out less maybe that's because i'm less linked up with djs who are knocking on my door asking for tracks but i think more than anything it's to do with a lack of vinyl vinyl was an amazing thing for collecting your thoughts and and stamping your ideas of that period uh and i don't think that that you know people should just produce vinyl if if no one's going to buy it then it then it then it's pointless uh and the lack of that drive means that i've got less of a drive to do that but that doesn't mean that music's less exciting for me. I feel I'm still excited to go out and play my live sets and uh, and the whole uh, coupling of my artistic approach to film uh, has has sort of opened it out. And uh, the I'm, I do AV sets. I do sets where I. Uh, play visuals that I've created. I like doing visuals for other people's music. So there's, there's, there, it's an evolution, a mutation. This, this sense that uh, we should continue to just keep driving forward records or or tracks as they were because that's what we used to do. I mean, seems seems a bit pointless to me. You mentioned AV sets, audiovisual sets. You also increasingly got into filmmaking. How did you get into that in the first place and what were all your first works in that field? I've wanted to be a filmmaker for a long, long time. When I was uh, eight or nine, I remember wanting to be a detective. So, uh, I mean, that that's not a cool thing, but um, <laughs> ACAB and everything. Uh, and after that, I mean, even 11, 12, I wanted to be a film director. And my mum saw an advert for, um, this was before the age of reality TV, uh, the early 90s. Um, and she saw an advert for this thing called Video Diaries. She said, Dan, you want to be a filmmaker? You're, you're directing this play at school. Why don't you go for that? And I wrote to them and they, they liked me. And I ended up producing a... 
uh, a documentary for BBC Two as one of the teenage video diaries uh, called The Greatest Director in the World. And it was me generally being a stuck up uh, 13 year old uh, who was uh, having his bar mitzvah, had divorced parents and wanted to, wanted to direct and and from then I went to children's film school and was really excited by film and it was what I wanted to do more than anything. When we first created the sound system, I wanted to do visuals and stuff for, uh, for them. But more and more within that period, 16, 17, 18, I pushed away from the snobbery and nepotism that I felt was everywhere in the film world, that you could only get somewhere at at my children's film school there was the people the prettiest girls and the guys that the kids that that you know uh are slick the teacher would get all the 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 cushy roles and me and the other kids who wouldn't do that we'd we'd be the runner on set and it was all like why are we getting these shit jobs and so that really pushed me away and for for a long period while i concentrated on hecate and and the music, I, I didn't want anything to do with film. And then at one point I, I thought, no, I, I do like film. And I started, even when I was on the road, popping back to England and making a few short films with Gabby Norland, uh, who'd come and shoot stuff for my mad ideas that I'd had. And I just got more and more drawn to that. And so I guess I saw it as, as, as a way out from from the sound system that was collapsing and uh, around me and wasn't really a, a force to be reckoned with. We weren't as Hecate a force to be reckoned with anymore. And I, I felt that that was a really strong artistic avenue that I should return to. So uh, I came back to England and I started running on set and then being art department while I was doing my own films uh, in the background and then writing and then eventually uh, managed to get the stuff together for my feature. Tell us more about the feature. Davy, one of the cohorts uh, which I started Hecate Sound System with, uh, moved out to Uganda about 13 years ago. And uh, a few years after I, I visited him and was just so inspired by people's thirst there for filmmaking um, and I taught some semesters there in semiotics and film we, we shot a short film and soon afterwards as we start me and Davey started pondering how we would go about creating a, a, a feature and we started batting around some ideas I was heavily inspired by Philip K Dick and other science fiction pioneers wanted to come up with something that was you know science fiction that that could be done in a way that didn't look cheap so we came up with this uh this drug that shows you the future and that along with my experience of the rave scene felt like a a good a good start for for the feature it's called imperial blue and it's about a a drug called Bulu that shows you the future that uh, that's in Uganda and this this drug smuggler who goes over there from the west to try and make it big and bring back a load back here but falls foul to Uganda and the drug itself. The film came out, it's uh, played at Raindance, uh, Mark Commode, The Guardian and other people reviewed it. Uh, you can find it online in in some countries. In other countries, we hope to bring out on Vimeo in in the coming months. Did it do well? No, it didn't make its money back. It's uh, it had a massive drop off. We were trying to distribute it during COVID, uh, and it had no named actors in, so it didn't find any sort of big distribution channels. Was it a complete failure? No, not also because. You know, it's got a Rotten Tomatoes page, it had reviews, people have seen it, some people like it. It's It sort of sits somewhere in between. And, and now I'm in the struggle of many indie filmmakers trying to get my next feature off the ground, trying to find that balance between something that's commercially viable but still is 
potent enough to incorporate social issues because for me to just do a film that's only entertainment, I'd feel um, like I was disappointing myself. Uh, uh, so, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I guess that's, that's how I'd sum it up. Go and watch it. <laughs> so what are you working on at the moment? Do you manage to strike a balance between music, filmmaking and writing, something we haven't talked about yet, or are you focusing on just one of these at any given time? I guess you could see it as a glass half full or glass half empty type of, uh, it depends how I'm feeling about things. Uh, I'm, I find time to produce music and it's very easy for me to just slip back into something. Uh, and because I've removed completely the commercial aspect from my music making, I'm happy to go to play for free whenever or be booked for a fee, whatever's, wh whatever feels right for the party. So if it's a free party where no one's making money, then I don't want to be paid. If I'm playing at an event where people are making money, then yeah, you better pay me because you, someone's making money somewhere. And, um, but, uh, and having removed that, I feel very free to just express myself how I want. And uh, with all the uh, wealth of software and samples uh, that are out there, um, as well as being collaborating with a host of other musicians. Uh, yeah, I'm hugely inspired by what I'm doing musically. I've got uh, a band that I've started with, uh, Will from Dead Silence, who used to DJ for uh, us on Hecate as the Reverend, and uh, Phil, who's a spoken word artist, storyteller, who's our front man. We're called Brace Brace, and uh, I combine uh, my filmmaking with the music there in that it's a whole story about this post-apocalyptic flight stewards who crash land and um, that I'd say is a very good coming together of the two things that I enjoy the, the storytelling and, and the music making. Uh, we find it difficult to get gigs though because we don't sit very easily, we're not theatrical enough to be a theatre performance We're a bit too noisy to be with other bands. We're a bit too bandy to be just on a, in an electronic night. If only Hecate were doing more events, we'd, we'd sit perfectly there, but uh, we only do a, a couple of events a year. As for the filmmaking, um, yeah, I'm working on a number of things. I'm trying to get a, a couple of projects on off, off the ground, uh, scripts that I've written, but it, it it's difficult. The Uh, more and more as a filmmaker, I want to pay people. I want to pay people for their work. It's it's all very well when you're doing a short film. You've got people coming for one, two days. You do them, a, they do you a favor, and then in return you somehow you somehow help them out. But when you're doing a feature, it's it sits so badly not to pay people when they're dedicating months of their time and. You know, and you're demanding, I'm very demanding, uh, to to create something that's very strong, then it's it's impossible not to pay them. And that's where that commercial aspect comes in. And this is difficult. It's a difficult conversation in the underground to, to speak about um, commercial viability. But people have got to eat. And if you want people to dedicate their time, uh, then you need to find a way to pay them. And so... That's that is what is very difficult and I struggle with that and so I guess the way that I'm dealing with that as a filmmaker is I've got more commercial projects that would cost a bit more money to make and then I'm developing other stuff that's that's cheaper that I could do for very little money um, that might not have as much reach. And what are you working on right now and or in the near future? I don't really like, I, I wouldn't want to tell you exactly what I'm doing now because a film project that I'm working on now might not be the same in six months or a year. And and so I'd, I'd, I'd decline to comment on that. Uh, musically, um, I've got uh, this, this Brace Brace Band project. I'm in a duo called Incherata with Amusement. 
uh, which is which is very exciting for me as a musician who's never really been in bands to do these these projects as a duo or as or or as a band that uh, feels like the more than the sum of its parts. Uh, I've also got uh, different live sets that I'm working on, ones that are more broken dance floor, ones that are more sit down and you know sort of more for noise events and and those are those are hugely exciting. Uh, I'm uh, but as for the scripts and the films, I, I'm going to keep those under wraps. You just have to watch the space, as they say. <laughs>